In the oration of the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, the prayer of the Mass, the Church prays, May thy grace, we beseech thee, O Lord, ever go before us and follow us. May it make us ever intent upon good works. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. <clears throat> Psalm 125 teaches us an important truth. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. In today's epistle, St. Paul begins, he writes to the Ephesians, Brethren, I pray you not to faint at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. In other words, St. Paul, writing from prison, he is pointing out to his faithful who are saddened and distressed for him. He says, I have willingly endured all these things, stripes, imprisonment, and hunger and thirst, all for your sakes, that the grace of Christ might make you all saints. I sow indeed in tears, and I know I shall therefore reap in joy. And you, my Ephesians, you are the fruits of my tears. In the Gospel just read, our Lord speaks a parable to those invited. <clears throat> this parable is unique in that the spiritual lesson our Lord is teaching is not as apparent as in other parables. Rather, what is most obvious is the rebuke given. A parable is something, it's a tool. Our Lord used it often, a tool for teaching. It is to use things that are familiar and invisible, realities that are common and visible. He uses those to teach us something about those realities that are un or invisible and spiritual. And so it's important, this remark in the gospel text, that our Lord spoke a parable. And then he proceeds to speak to them, it seems, humanly. He marks that they were taking, the Pharisees, they were sort of vying one with one another to take the best seats at this banquet. Our Lord says, well, rather, if you want to have honor, this doesn't make sense because you endanger yourselves to having rather shame, to receiving great shame by being told to go lower. Then he goes on to tell them what they should do, how they ought to act. And this is where the lesson lies. He tells them to do what seems contrary to the very goal they have in mind, contrary, what seems contrary to the very desires. He tells them the way to true honor and peace and happiness is humility, humiliations. He expressed this same reality in other words, more explicitly, later on in his public life, he would say, <clears throat> he who would have his life shall lose it, and he who would lose his life for my sake shall find it. Take up thy cross and follow me. The cross represents just that, the contradiction, the thing contrary. It is this that must needs be planted and nurtured and with many tears. But these tears required of us, they are or can be a most sweet pledge that we will in fact have a great reward. Saint Therese, the little flower, taught this truth to her very, to her younger sister, Celine, and she wrote it down in fine words in a book she wrote herself. 
these are her words, it is the little things, little at least, in the eyes of other men, which, however, cost us very much. Many tears, perhaps. Those are the things that count before God. It is really only those things that can make you truly a great saint in God's eyes. <clears throat> Immediately following this excerpt from the gospel, read before the sermon, uh, our Lord continues in the gospel of St. Uh, Luke, if you would consult that, and he now speaks a new parable to the host. First he addressed the, those invited, now he speaks to the host. He told him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, nor thy kinsmen, nor thy neighbors who are rich, lest perhaps they also invite thee again, and the recompense be made to thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, because they have not wherewith to make thee recompense. For recompense shall be made thee at the resurrection of the just. <clears throat> Our Lord does not forbid that we should entertain family or friends, but rather that for these things we are able to do with an intention of charity. They are able to be meritorious, but yet he seems to command to forbid that. And why is it? He is speaking to a Pharisee, and this Pharisee had that bad inclination. It was a habit. He knew this. And so he proposed a remedy for this Pharisee. He said, invite the poor and sick, those whom, from whom there is no possibility of recompense. And if you do that, you cannot do that, in fact, without having that pure intention. And so this exercise will purify your hearts. And with that intention learned, you can then even exercise that with your friends. To act otherwise, that is to seek always and only recompense from our neighbor, from our fellow men, is a dangerous game to play. For if we, for example, offer hospitality in order to, in the hope of receiving the like, we may very well be disappointed, which will lead to sadness or even anger. If, on the other hand, we may, in fact, our, our plans are fulfilled and we receive the like that we hope for, well, very simply, our, we have received our reward. We, there is nothing more we can expect or hope for from God. We ought, therefore, uh, dear faithful, to look always, or at least sometimes rather, to perform good acts, that is, acts which are like the ones recommended to the Pharisees, from which we cannot hope to expect any recompense in this life. By doing acts like that, they are very hard, but to do those, sometimes it helps to purify your intentions in your heart. Remember the adage, those, they that sow in tears, they shall reap in joy. <clears throat> Concerning this very image provided by the Psalms of the sower and the reaper, St. Robert Bellarmine comments, the sower ordinarily does his work in grief and sorrow, being obliged to put his corn into the ground, without having any certainty of ever getting the smallest return from it. And therefore he seems to labor and to tire himself in order to lose what he has. For as our Lord said himself, unless the wheat fall into the ground and die, it cannot bear fruit. By casting those seeds, dispensing them, they seem to to vanish in the, in the earth. But when the harvest comes, he reaps with great joy when he sees the corn that, to all appearance, was lost, 
And now, instead of being lost, we turned to him with enormous increase. There is this difference, it's a big difference, St. Robert continues to remark, between sowing seed and almsgiving, or any act of charity, any good work done with the right intention. Namely this, that many things may in fact occur which thwart the growth of those seeds for the farmer. Even though he may have uh, sowed in tears, he may in fact not reap in joy. Sometimes it happens. But nevertheless, with those spiritual works, the spiritual seed sown, this never happens because they are stored in heaven. Today, we celebrate the nativity of Our Lady. Her very birth, the circumstances that came before her, verify again this principle that they who sow in tears will reap joy. Her parents, St. Joachim and Anne, they were barren for many years. And they did pray, they did works of charity together in acts of penance, begging God to take away their reproach and to bestow a child. And they persevered so, in, these, in this manner, throughout their whole marriage for many years, until they began to grow old together, and all hope of a child vanished. St. Joachim, he went to the temple now to offer a sacrifice very generously and beseeching God to hear their prayer by a miracle. And he did this knowing that prayers and sacrifices offered in the temple are very efficacious. Well, his plan fell contrawise for no sooner had he arrived in the temple and the priest made discovered his identity, and he turned him away. For because he was barren for the Jews, that was a sign of God's curse, that you were a great sinner. And so the priest, he did not want have to have anything to do with Joachim. So he was turned away. And not only that, but he received greater shame and reproach instead of the consolation he hoped for. St. Anne, for her part, having considered diligently their sad lot, and at her wit's end, you might say, she spoke to her husband and she had this final plan. They would pray thus, Lord, if thou wilt but grant us a child, we will consecrate this child to thy service in the temple. This great act of generosity, hypothetical, albeit, it was the last one required by God, and he heard their prayer. The child was given, and this child was better than anything they could have ever asked for, anything anyone could ever can imagine, for this was the fairest of all creatures, the mother of our Savior. Concerning the qualities of this babe, our, our lady, first and foremost, she was born free from all sin. She was conceived immaculately. She was born in the state of grace. She was the friend of God, and in fact, she had been given a greater plenitude of grace than all the saints and angels combined. She was also given by special privilege, the use of reason from her infancy. So she knew by an act of the intellect, God, and she, by an act of the will, loved him. And she also knew the sad state of the world of sinners, of you and I. And she, from that very fo first moment when the dawn fell upon her as a new babe, she began her mission of praying and interceding for us of offering her very self, everything she had and possessed, 
to God's service in order to save the world. Her very body, her eyes, her voice, as a result of the great beauty of her soul, we mentioned, they also drew from the soul a most a great beauty. They were very attractive, and they ravished the hearts of all those who would behold, behold her. Hence, uh, we can hardly fathom how dear she must have become to her parents for her first three years that she spent with them. Those three years having been spent, it was time to fulfill their promise, and they brought her to the temple and presented her to the priest to serve henceforth God and the temple, and they would no longer see her. They had to suffer now the separation from this dearest creature that ever was. They endured many and great sacrifices for this child, and yet they were able to enjoy her so little, at least in this life. But now in heaven they do forever enjoy Our Lady, her company, her conversation, and they enjoy it as from a child. She, in turn, she loves them as most dear parents, most loving parents who gave up, who thought nothing of themselves, but rather helped her to become the mother of God, ultimately. They sowed in tears, but have reaped in great joy. Let us, therefore, dear faithful, not be dismayed when the rosary or other devotions practiced to Our Lady, when they become dry, when the sweetness it seems to wither away. They who sow in tears, they shall reap in joy. What's important for you is that you maintain discipline and regularity, consistency in the practice of those devotions. That is where they are truly proven. They are made truly valuable in the eyes of Our Lady. Because when they are, when they feel like work, when there's no satisfaction, it's all for her, and nothing is kept for ourselves. In the prayer for this Mass, the Mass of Our Lady's Nativity, the Church prays, Bestow upon thy servants, we beseech thee, O Lord, the gift of heavenly grace, that as the Nativity of our Blessed Virgin stood for the beginning of our salvation, so may this solemn feast grant us an increase of peace. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.